Hello again, my gentle and modern apes, and welcome back to the Gutsick Gibbon channel, where we look at things with regard to paleontology and primatology and anthropology, and occasionally we bust some creationism. Although I am trying to pivot more away from busting creationism, as at least my, my primary topic of interest on this channel in, in favor of more enjoyable conventional science, I do have a couple of loose end series to tie up, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Which is why, to your utter shock, I'm sure, we are revisiting Genesis Apologetics' Seven Myths series today. And by revisiting, I mean we're gonna start finishing it. <laughs> so we can have that, um, that albatross off from around my neck. I hope everyone's down there is uh, doing well. I've got myself a nice tea here, just like the good old days back when I was living in my flat in the UK. I've got my tea and I'm ready to tackle some Genesis apologetics. That was a dog, sorry. That was a dog too. We have a doozy today uh, as well. Though We're finally touching in on some of the human evolution claims that Genesis apologetics makes. And this is why I started the series in the first place. This was what I thought was going to be the most interesting part. But the crazy thing is, a lot of it we, we've covered in different avenues. I still think you're going to enjoy it, though. There are some surprises. Plus, you know, I do love to tangle with Dan Biddle and the rest of the, uh, of the Biddle boys. So allow me to set it up. <laughs> So, it's very close to midnight where I'm at, it's a dark and stormy evening, and I find both of these to be excellent prerequisites for tackling Genesis apologetics. Biddle biddle, nonsense and drivel, apologists shill and churches quibble, as it were. That was like a little Macbeth riff for the lot of you. I hope you appreciate that. That took like three takes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Most of this is off the cuff. Let us, um, let us begin. That was not off the cuff, though. I, I, I came, up, came up with that in advance. I wanted to impress you guys with my rhyming skills. I wasn't kidding, though. As we can see right here, we do have some serious shilling going on. If you'll remember, Genesis Apologetics is very keen on pushing their app in between their videos. I personally am enjoying working my way through the full movie, um, a full-scale feature film, naturally, Unfortunately, the only thing keeping this out of theaters is COVID. Otherwise, I'm sure it'd be a real blockbuster. <laughs> um, I, I do still enjoy their graphic here. I like this. I think it's minimalistic. I, I, I think there's some weird shit going on with the face. It's a little lopsided. It's kind of got like this weird bulbous nose. Looks m not unlike a proboscis monkey. Um, it, some of you may know them as Dutch monkeys. I'll show you a picture of them because I think they're awesome. Proboscis, monkey, female aggression. That's for my thesis. Try not to uh, read into it too much. I'm hoping to publish, so I can't tell you too much about it. Yeah, so proboscis monkey, these guys. <laughs> this is peak human physical perfection. <laughs> Deal with it. You may not like it, but this is peak physical perfection. Peak human performance, I think that's actually the meme. Um, yeah, that, that's the vibes I'm getting from this. But, um, ugh, God, I'm procrastinating. Let's just get it over with. Myth number four is Adam and Eve were not real people. Only allegories used to describe the first humans. Many professors in secular and even some Christian colleges place the Genesis creation account on equal footing with mythological writings from the ancient Near East. Indeed, one can look back in history and find many different accounts of human origins. What makes the Genesis account stand apart? Is there scientific evidence that supports the Bible's account of human origins? Let's no, <laughs> I can answer that for you in advance. No, there is not anything scientific that supports the biblical account of origins within a young earth creationist context. Um, there's something very important that I want you guys to keep in mind as we continue to move through these myths, and it's something that I 
I because I haven't actually watched rewatched these these old videos, the old myths that I've covered. I'm not sure if I've I can't remember, I cannot recall if I have properly emphasized this point, but something that you absolutely must keep in mind when we're covering these videos is that Genesis Apologetics is presenting an interpretation of the Bible, of the Christian Bible. There isn't one interpretation, there isn't one denomination, as this is as evidenced by the, the sheer division that we see in the modern day church. And, you know, that's, that's not to say necessarily that that's a bad thing. I think it's good that people have their takes on the, on the Christian Bible, particularly if it means um, quite a bit to them. But that being said, there, it becomes quite a large problem in my eyes when you are shilling out your interpretation as if it is the only correct one, period, end of story, no arguments, this is settled. So I have a bit of a problem with um, Genesis Apologetics putting forward this idea of their, their non-allegorical, non-literalistic point of view of Genesis being the only correct one, definitively. I, I just, I find it kind of arrogant, honestly. Uh, Answers in Genesis does this a lot too, where they'll, they'll do like their God's word, man's word thing in their museum. Hold on. Answers in Genesis, God's word, man's word. I'm still recovering again from this cold. I'm recording a lot of these in advance because I've I've got a period of time where I can actually kind of get some stuff done um, while I'm waiting for a meeting with my supervisor for thesis stuff. So I can I can put off working on the thesis for the exact moment. Um, yeah. So so here we go. So this is a Ken Ham thing. A man's word, <laughs> lies. Oh, what is that? Comic Sans. God's word, truth. He very frequently pushes this as if it is a. Um, a, a dichotomy, a perfect dichotomy, when in reality, what it is, is a false equivalency fallacy, right? Uh, there isn't one, first of all, these two things aren't on equal footing. They're not even regarding the same type of understanding. You got the empiricism of science versus the kind of um, more metaphysical ideologies behind religions. But more importantly, Ken Ham and Genesis Apologetics both put forward this whole young earth creationism thing as if it is the end all be all correct interpretation. When like Gallup polls actually tell us that more people by a very large margin who identify as Christian also accept the ancient age of the earth and evolution, even human evolution. So, I mean, for God's sakes, the Pope is cool with evolution. I mean, it's, it's baby steps, but it's steps nonetheless. I just, I, I don't know. I, I really don't like this one. I know a lot of Christians who this makes very upset very frequently. And the young earth creationists love it because they get to draw a line in the sand and essentially guilt those who are on the fence and maybe not like full of scientific know-how into thinking that they have to take one position um, over the empirical position of science or else, you know, shakes fist ominously <laughs> like you're going against God's word. Um, so keep that in mind. What we're dealing with here is empirical science versus an interpretation of the Christian Bible. Let's look and find out. The Bible is very clear about human origins. Genesis lays out who made us. God, or Elohim in the Hebrew, what we were made from, dust, how we were made, divinely spoken into existence, who we were made like in God's image, our role in creation, dominion, and our marital covenant for family. Scripture even includes when we were created during creation week, day six, and the time in history, about 6,000 years ago, based on the genealogies in Genesis. Yeah, so that's a real key one there, because the Bible doesn't actually say when this happened. Um, it doesn't give a specific date, right? It's not time stamped as who was I think that I think it was Ken or Kent Hovind who used to say, ah, you don't find the you don't pull these fossils up out of the dirt with a uh, with a, a, a date of expiration on them, do you? Uh, no, what you find is dead things buried by water. And that's that's my that's my Kent impression. It's no Dr. Josh, but go easy on me. Um, yeah, so that's just not something that the Bible, like, says. It's fine, you know, that you want to do, like, the Bishop Usher thing and, like, walk it backwards, but those genealogies, at least according to some academic sources, God, I know, <laughs> imagine consulting the scholars, gross, but that those 
dates aren't actually 100% transparent in, in how simplistic they are, right? Like, there are some individuals who think that um, the, the long ages of the patriarchy are based off of, like, squaring certain numbers, like the Babylonians did, using roots of 10, things of that nature, roots of 12. The, the, you know, the ancient people were really weird about ages, so you can't necessarily, with any kind of certainty, say um, that, that you could just walk it backwards like that, particularly because conventional science tells us that people don't live to be 500. I would love that. I wouldn't because I'm a millennial, but I, you know, I love it in theory for people. Um, let's, let's just continue. I, this is going to be, oh God, this, this is going to be a long one. I want to, to poke fun at one more thing. Notice too, that when he talks about the purpose of humanity, he says dominion and does not actually mention the other purpose, which is stewardship and, and like, uh, to take care of the planet. A lot of, a lot of younger creationists and evangelicals in general really don't like the idea of having to keep up after themselves, clean up after themselves when it comes to the planet, um, because environmentalism is for the libs, according to them. So, and it's all, you know, it's, it's very doom culty in a lot of ways. It's all dedicated to kind of triggering this second coming. So, eh, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of evangelicals. I, I, God, is that clear yet? Next, scripture is consistent about this account, with every Bible contributor in both the Old and New Testaments holding to the same description of how we came to be spanning 66 books over 1,500 years written by 40 writers in three languages on three continents. Billions of people over the millennia have regarded the Bible's account of origins as historical and quite literal. Could they have all been wrong? First of all, yes, they could have all been wrong. This is something that we see quite a bit. There were just oodles and oodles of incredibly successful civilizations that were pretty incorrect on both human origins and aspects of life around them. That's why they all had independent mythologies, right? As for the the alternative views of Genesis, right, they, he's, they've got like the, the day-age theory, the gap theory, whatever, as if these are very new um, uh, kind of novelties within the church, but people as early as St. Augustine and Origen early church, early ass church fathers, right? These people were suggesting that maybe the Genesis account in, in Genesis 1-1 ought to be taken allegorically speaking. And they weren't coming at it from an angle of conventional science tells us one thing. These guys didn't know what a fossil was, right? They were talking really, really early. Um, but they still understood that the text of Genesis is very unique. It presents itself in a sort of exalted prose. It's not poetry, but it's not narrative and historical. Uh, this is something that a lot of scholars, and by a lot, I mean any scholar worth their salt, tends to agree on, that the language in Genesis is somewhat unique. That being said, it's not going to stop Dan Biddle's kind of um, henchman here from walking us through a lot of incorrect information. So this chart, first of all, not correct. Let me actually find the date that Origin lived. Origin Church? Yeah, so he lived in, <laughs> this guy lived in 185 to 254. Those, <laughs> we're talking three digit numbers here, people. Very old men. As well as St. Augustine. Hello? Come on. <coughs> um, no, we don't want the city in Florida. That's, that's not the one I'm talking about. Church father. Florida's ruining everything again. They're always up to no good. So then we've also got another man living in the in the triple digits. So I would revise this severely and place these two viewpoints like right around here, right? Midway between, or before the midpoint of the time of Christ in 1000 AD. But of course, it would be too much to ask that Dan Biddle's um, ilk present this in an honest fashion. I don't like Genesis apologetics. I think they're shady, but let's let them continue. Scripture is clear that Adam was the first man and Eve the first woman, the mother of the human race. The Apostle Paul inseparably connects Jesus to Adam, with Jesus coming to redeem us from the curse of sin and death brought by Adam. 
Paul also describes how Adam and Eve specifically as individuals fell into temptation. The Gospel of Luke even connects Christ's genealogy to Adam and Adam's son who lived after him. How could that be mythical? Without a real Adam, a real garden, a real tree, and a real enemy that led Adam and Eve into sin, the consequences for sin laid out in Genesis 3 has no foundation. And without this, the Gospel and the entire New Testament has nothing to stand on. Because of the sin nature we inherit... Appreciate that they're hip with the kids and using like a hydraulic press to get this message across. If you are older than two, you should remember last year, hydraulic press... Actually, God, when was that? That might have been even earlier than that. Time keeps on slipping, people. But there was a hydraulic press trend on YouTube that it seems Genesis Apologetics was trying to hitch their proverbial wagon to, if you will. Um, <laughs> there's some interesting things I want to talk about here. This idea that necessarily there has to be a literal Adam. And we're going to get into that when we start looking into the, the hermeneutics of the word Adam, which is the word that's used in Genesis 1 through like 7, I believe, if memory serves. But it's important. We have to know <coughs> what the word can mean and what it likely meant within the context of the early Hebrews when they were living. Because we can come at this from an angle of, was there a literal Adam and Eve and a young earth creation event? No, we can prove that empirically. That's what I do on this channel. That's how I make the big bucks. But we could also come at it from a different angle, which is, should Christians look at it that way? Are they bound by scripture to see it from a young earth perspective? And I think that is a hearty no effing way. I really do. I don't think that there's any, any bearing for that. I think you could if you wanted to, but I don't think there's any way, um, hermeneutically speaking, and I'm not an expert on it, but I'm going to be making my case, to claim that that, that is the only way of interpreting this. But I think he's going to start touching on the usage of Adam later, so I'm, we're going to put a pin in that, right? Put a, put a little pin in it. Inherited from Adam, we are all in need of a savior. That's the very foundation of the gospel and the New Testament. That's the real YouTube rewind. We didn't get one this year. <laughs> what a shame. Did Jesus die for the sins <coughs> of a mythical Adam? Certainly not. Unlike ancient mythological writings, the Bible makes the unique claim to be inspired so the pages of scripture can be relied upon as words from God himself. The Jewish people and Christians have regarded scripture with this level of reverence for millennia. That's a tricky one, right? What does inspired by God mean? There are some who propose that this is like a, like a literal possession of people and God writing through these individuals, whereas others, more liberal Christians and indeed scholars suggest that the inspiration is kind of a, a feeling, um, like as one feels inspired to paint a certain painting, right? And there's, and there, of course, there's every position in between of literally being possessed by God, the God of the universe, and writing things down on like papyrus or whatever you have handy versus a general inspiration as in more of a vague sense. So, you know, again, there's this inspired by God thing falls in line with the whole inerrancy deal. Like, the Bible doesn't ever claim itself to be inerrant. It claims to be inspired by God. God is said to be perfect. Therefore, inerrancy is, to Christians, to some Christians, inferred there. You know, now I've got to double check this just to be sure. Here, hold on. We, we get to go on these Google adventures with one another quite often. Does the Bible claim it, claim to be inerrant? Proponents of biblical inerrancy often cite 2 Timothy 3.16 as evidence that scripture is inerrant. For this argument, they prefer translations that rendered the verse, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and they interpret this to mean that the whole Bible must be therefore inerrant. Now, that is certainly just from Wikipedia, but I think that no matter where you see people pulling this particular verse out to back inerrancy, the same holds true, and it's what I just said. Well, I look at this. I got a sharp memory for you guys. All for you. This is why I have a luminosity account. I don't have a luminosity account. In fact, Romans 1 even says that all of creation, including humans, are an obvious testimony to God's creative powers and invisible attributes. So 
What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Um, Romans 1.20. This is, it's interesting that they show this, because this is something that I used to use um, with creationists back when I was more of a heavy theistic evolutionist rather than kind of a, a sad agnostic. <laughs> Um, but but I, I find this to be particularly compelling because what I always interpreted Romans one twenty as saying is essentially those who don't believe in some kind of God or you know, and come reaching that conclusion with the right exposure would be the God of the Christian Bible are without excuse because he shows himself in creation, right? And in some ways this is kind of true pretty much every human culture looked at the world around them, saw the perceived complexity in it, and then formed these vast mythologies to explain it, the stuff that they couldn't explain on their own. So I think there's some truth to that saying, even in like a completely secular sense. But from a biblical standpoint, if you're looking at it from a Christian perspective, I think what this is saying is that because you can see God in creation, creation isn't going to outright be deceptive, which means if it looks quite old, it's probably quite old, right? So just my, my two cents on that. So people are without an excuse. <laughs> One of the most obvious examples that humans are created is found in our hearing system. Taking an honest look at our hearing system reveals an obvious designer. How could random mindless evolution engineer five separate components that have no purpose unless they are all joined together in a certain order and in a certain way for the purpose of hearing? Irreducible complexity arguments are asinine. And the reason is we can trace back the evolution of complex structures that exist today many times in incremental steps in living organisms. A classic example of this is the evolution of the eye, but the same is true with regard to, to the bones of the middle ear and indeed the entire hearing system humans have. Interestingly enough, the reptile mammal transition, that is the, the um, sort of the synapsids, the, the uh, therapsids and upward, that we see the emergence of a single middle ear bone go to three middle ear bones, and indeed the complex along with that, um, with the, the semicircular canals and the tympanic, how the tympanic membrane would have been situated, that whole system is overhauled in the Permian, right? As mammals come about and need to hear in a different way, right? Or rather, they don't need to hear, it's advantageous to select for better hearing. Snakes, on the other hand, in order to hear, they literally hold their jawbone right, right on the um, on the substrate, so that they can hear. When their heads are up like that, they can't. Reptiles lack the same uh, hearing system as mammals. But interestingly enough, our hearing system is all but identical to those of other apes. Now there are little tweaks here and there, specifically in the semicircular canals, which is kind of intentional because humans aren't really swinging around in the trees anymore, but similarly, an orangutan, which spends more time in the trees than, say, a chimpanzee, has a unique system to it as well. They're all incredibly similar, though, to be quite clear. Let's look up a cool picture. Just, um, how do snakes hear without ears? <laughs> snakes hear vibrations. They have no visible ears, so they don't hear sounds as we do. They have vestiges of the apparatus of hearing inside their heads, and the setup is attached to their jawbone, so they feel vibrations very well and may hear low borne or low frequency airborne sounds. Um, so they, they, they hold their heads to the ground. So here's the here's an interesting diagram that kind of goes through it. If it will actually show me in more than a six by six pixel uh, resolution. Yeah, here. Here's your little cartoon. That's kind of fun. How snakes hear in stereo. Look at that. The vibrations from the jaw move up to their remaining middle ear bone, and that's all she wrote. At least I believe it's still a middle ear bone. Again, reptiles aren't typically like my go-to. Let's see, the vomeronasal organ, the buccal cavity, a uh, snake, let's see, it's the, it wouldn't be the ramus, middle ear bone, maybe? I don't know, would that be it? 
Yeah, so in this picture right here, which exemplifies what I was saying pretty well, you can see the reptile mammal transition in where the middle ear bones are. The differences between your average reptile and your average mammal. Reptiles have one of the middle ear bones in place, and mammals have all three. So the malus, the incus, and the stapes in the mammal, and just the stapes in the reptile. So good to know. And interestingly enough, this reptile, while it's, it's kind of auditory apparatus, as it were, is a bit more basal, right? It gets the job done. That's how evolution works. And I want to show you something else that's really, really cool. Kangaroo rat in utero. Maybe that's maybe that's what I'm looking for here. Please show me the picture that I want. Oh, yeah, I thought my life is incredibly difficult. Mammal ear bones evolution kangaroo rat. Maybe. Here it is. Sweet. You're lucky I know the Google foo. So this is um <coughs> this is an actual like imaging software that has modeled this for us in in living animals. So the dragon here would be like I believe this is an actually I think this is an agama or it might be a it might be a bearded dragon. It's a reptile, nevertheless. Is compared with the fossil mammal relatives. This may be like a cynodont. Um it looks kind of like a cynodont or maybe like thrinaxodon. Let me show you who I'm talking about. Thrinaxodon Thrinaxodon. Yeah this guy. So it's like um like this early guy right here. I think Thrinaxodon is a Cynodont. This, this is the skull I'm thinking that they're actually looking at here, uh, but I can't be sure. I'm People in the comments are going to be like, or in the side chat are going to be like, yeah, yeah, it is a Cynodont. Okay, that's what I thought. Look at this. <clears throat> I'm nailing it tonight. So we've got, uh, or yeah, so a reptile, a Cynodont, which is very proto-e mammal kind of thing, like I just showed you, a newborn kangaroo rat, and an adult kangaroo rat. And when we're looking at where the middle ear bones are positioned in any of these given animals here, what's something that you notice? I'll give you just a second while I sip from my tea. <laughs> okay, time's up. If you said, wow, it sure looks like the evolutionary sequence is being recapitulated in utero, um, yes that would be correct, or rather in ontogeny, since this is a newborn rat kangaroo. See, I was saying kangaroo rat. Um, in the reptile, we have the positioning of the three middle ear bones mimicking what we see, albeit in a larger fashion, in this newborn kangaroo rat, right? It's shifted more like this, and it's much smaller, but there it is nevertheless. Compare that to the fossil mammal relative, which is more derived in its middle ear structures than this reptile and the adult kangaroo rat, where both the the reptile condition and the newborn rat kangaroo's kind of mechanism or um, setup has become more derived for the for the classic hearing. Right. Basically, it's something that's really cool that we can see in in developing animals, um, evolution being recapitulated. So no, the the inner ear. This irreducible complexity argument is bad. It's always been bad, right? If you'll remember correctly, or if you'll remember um, with me for a moment, Michael Behe, one of the famous ID proponents in Kitzmiller versus Dover, the ID creationism in disguise uh, lawsuit of 2005, I think it was, Behe was up there just really waxing poetically about how complex, like, blood was, right? He's like, ah, it's irreducibly complex. You can't evolve that. You can't evolve that. Can't explain that. And um, famously, the the opposing side, right, the prosecution, I think it was, just came forward with, like, book after book after book that covered the evolution of blood and those pathways. And Behe was just speechless. Um, that's perhaps a romanticized version, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, but, you know, for what it's worth, it was a, uh, a rather based and epic uh, exchange. Even if some random process could put together just one of these five components, it takes engineering and intelligence to join these five parts together so that the sound waves from speech could be heard and then immediately interpreted as communication in our minds. The eye might even be more convincing. 
containing hundreds of parts that had to be assembled to create the overall purpose and function for seeing. Random chance certainly doesn't have the intelligence needed for assembling different parts into a cohesive, interdependent system for sight to work. Next, let's... Why not, though? Again, you know, the eye is not irreducibly complex. Evolution of the eye, eye spots. This is not a complicated concept, right? It, you can Google this in like six seconds. And what we get is an evolution, right? We can see it here, and then the, I like this as well because this shows the organisms along with it. Um, but as usual, it's about four pixels by four pixels in resolution, which simply isn't going to work for us. Um, yeah, so this is this is an interesting one specifically because it's looking more at um, a, a taxa, a lineage that's unique from ours. So we tend to be very biased towards mammals, uh, and of the mammals, we're biased towards the primates because we are primates and we are mammals. But in this case, what we're looking at is, please show me in big, please show me in big mode. You know what? Look at this. You're welcome. Well, that's just not that much better. Can you guys actually even see that? Yeah, you can see it, kind of. Okay, well, I'll just narrate it really well. As you can see in this example of evolution in action, we have the very, very basal limpet in the beginning of our evolution of the eye with the simple patch of light-sensitive cells known as a... Uh, a, a very beginning precursor to the eye structures that we know and love. Second to that, we see something known as an eye cup. Why would an eye cup develop, you may ask yourself? Well, it is quite simple. An organism that is capable of understanding the direction from which light is coming from is going to be favorable over an organism who can simply detect light versus dark. This simple eye cup allows directionality to come into play and allows our alabone ab abalone abalone i don't even know what an abalone is abalone an abalone is a common name for any group of small to very large sea snails so they're gastropods we really are in mollusk town over here of the abalone even more favorable than the abalone would be that of the nautilus, which has a simple pinhole camera type eye, which allows the organism to get a bit more uh, uh, resolution to its images by adding a fluid filled cavity that also allows the eye to be a bit more robust and incapable of injury. Or I guess it would be um, impervious, a more impervious nature to, in, to injure, went up against injury. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you can see the direction that I'm going with this. Uh, essentially, each one of these stages is going to be more favored than the previous stage. So all you really need is this initial step, right, where you get this patch of light sensitive cells on the skin. And interestingly enough, um, your skin cells are already currently light sensitive. Um, you may not know it, but that is indeed the case. Our, our skin cells are capable of detecting light. It's, it's just a, a fact, right? Your, your epithelial cells all over your body are just really good at co-opting function, as it were. Um, I think that's how you would phrase that. Anyways, so from the limpet to the abalone to the nautilus to the marine snail to the squid, we see progressively more complex eyes, and this process was seen in convergent evolution in in both the movement from land to or from sea to land in your tetrapods as well as in the arthropods and eventually you get this transparent protective protective tissue which is the cornea on the outside of the eye um, and then you have this nice retina and all of these again are seen in living organisms so it's just not all that complicated very many people, too, a great many people will uh, point out, that was a bit Trump assertion, a great many people, everyone's pointing it out, uh, that <laughs> the eye could be better designed, right? Because of the way that the optic nerve leaves our skull. I'll show you. You guys know how much I love skulls. Allow me to bigify myself down here very bigly. Allow me to make myself a bit larger so that you can appreciate just how big and how epic my skull collection truly is um okay here we go yeah so in this human skull you see that hole in the back of the skull there yeah that one right 
there that you can like shove your pinky finger into i wouldn't recommend it but you could certainly do it that's where the optic nerve leaves the skull and that's our blind spot humans do indeed have a blind spot this this hole in the base or the back of the uh, orbits also exists in the likes of our primate cousins as you can see in this rhesus macaque replica there they are right in the backs of the skull right where they should be um, or rather shouldn't be if you're creating a perfect design, right? You wouldn't include a blind spot. Blind spot. Oh, but I'm sure it's just a result of the fall, right? <coughs> Pardon me. Anyways, yeah, Genesis Apologetics does this a lot where they just make these really bogus arguments from uh, incredulity because they're just like, they can't be bothered to look into this in the slightest. Um, a couple of other times too, I've seen creationists even take it to the point where they'll be like, naming a bunch of different systems like skeletal system you got your gastrointestinal you've got your nervous you've got your cardiovascular you've got like all of these sim s huge complicated systems man how are you going to get an evolution of all of these systems that are interdependent on one another with precursor structures perhaps those precursor structures are also interdependent on one another but you go back far enough and you reach an animal whose systems aren't interdependent. We see this in basal organisms today. So as usual, um, I, I really do hate owning the creationists in such a way, but I, I simply must. I can't help myself. Um, were I a lesser primate, I would, I would purchase, I would design and then purchase a cup that said uh, creationist tears, right? Just so that you can really know it's time to unsubscribe from my channel. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever do that, um, that's that's your that's your go ahead. Okay. Let's take a quick <coughs> tour of some scientific discoveries over just the last few decades that give strong evidence for the Bible's account of human origins. Let's start by looking at DNA, a protein coding language that cannot be replicated by any scientist in the world. It's the most sophisticated information storage system in the known universe. I really like when they do this. It's scientists have been they, they they've been trying and they can't. All of them they try to replicate the DNA system. It's such an excellent coding system, but they can't do it. None of them can do it. Um, no, humans can't make mountains either. Nor can we replicate the complexity in a simple backyard ecosystem like the ones you find in a pond. Um, just because something is complex doesn't mean nature can't make it. We see it all the time. Bad argument, and um, you should feel bad about that, Genesis Apologetics. Also, we could go over this whole thing where, like, when, when DNA is being called, like, a computer code and, like, a language, there's a lot of kerfuffle in the bioinformatics community over whether or not that language should be used, that terminology should be used. I find that as a descriptor, um, it, it's fine. Like, it's fine to use it in analogies and things like that. Uh, but to say that it's literally those things is not appropriate, in my opinion. Nothing comes even <coughs> close. In fact, over 10,000 DNA molecules can fit on the head of a pin. And unfolding just one of them reveals six feet of instructions capable of building who you are. Stretching out DNA in the trillions of cells in your body could reach to the sun and back hundreds of times. Perhaps you've heard that humans and chimps share 98% of their DNA. Make my day, Genesis Apologetics. Just make my day. Say it. Cite Jeffrey Tompkins. Do it. But did you know that when they made this comparison, they ignored 18% of the chimp genome and 25% of the human genome? Plus, the chimp genome is over 6% larger than ours. When they give the 98% similarity figure, it's based on cherry-picked DNA regions that were similar. Of course, humans and chimps have similar DNA. They're mammals living in the world with similar requirements for biological life. Our DNA is also similar to several other creatures. What about DNA research that purportedly shows our genome dates back tens of thousands of years, far outreaching the biblical timeline? So yeah, I guess he's not going to cite Tompkins. Damn, I wish he would have. I, I do like, I see that quite often, this this thing where they're like, oh, God, they didn't use X amount percent of this genome and X amount percent of this genome. Um, that's because those regions are essentially these, these nonsensical repeats. 
And very frequently, the reason that they're not comparing them is because they haven't actually been sequenced. So you might be thinking to yourself, and I did a, I did a whole video on it, link in the description. You might be thinking to yourself, say, didn't I hear that the entire human genome was sequenced already, like a long time ago? And the answer is yes. The vital bits of the human genome have been sequenced. Everything that does something has been sequenced. But because of the nature of DNA and the nature of how mutations accumulate, that's the word I'm looking for, and duplication uh, events accumulate, you end up with a lot of nonsensical repeats that add nothing really to the genome itself. Those bits are left out when we're talking about sequencing the genome because they don't do anything. You, you could sequence them. It would be a waste of time and money, which is why they didn't do it. So if we want to play by the rules that Genesis Apologetics is laying out here, no genome ever has been fully sequenced, not even the highest priority one, the human genome. Now, the interesting thing is when you line up the protein coding regions the regions of the genome that does stuff, you end up with 98.8% identical between humans and chimps. That's just the number, right? Now, these guys don't like that. Jeffrey Tompkins, he doesn't like that. They all throw these big fits about it. Tompkins is a creation scientist. He's been trying for decades to get this whole thing thrown out. Um, he's, he's like the, uh, the, the deadbeat dad coming back and trying to gain custody over and over and over again, but not actually changing his behavior because Tompkins actually tried to publish a paper like roasting this similarity in a creationist journal and got BTFO'd by Ruhif, right? Glenn Williamson, who's not like a geneticist, he's, he's, a, he's a tech guy. And even he figured out that Tompkins reached his similarity. He was basically publishing saying, no, actually it's only 70%. Uh, and, and Williamson came out and was like, but you're using a bugged version of the program. The man didn't know that he was using a broken version. So, you know, he does it again. He ends up with this, and I think it was like 86, 84%, something along those lines. Um, but the way that he did that is also this is going to shock you, supremely flawed, but I did go over it in detail previously. You can find it in the description. Now he's going to talk about um, this, oh God, oh God, please mention Jensen. I hope he does. Recent research into <coughs> mitochondrial DNA mutation rates gives the answer. This is unique because it comes only from the mother's egg, making it useful for tracing maternal ancestry. Since DNA was sequenced in 1981, researchers have been studying the mutation rates in mtDNA to try and estimate when different groups of people possibly diverged. Evolutionary researchers have based these timelines on the assumption that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor about 5 million years ago. That date was based on counting the mtDNA and protein differences between all the great apes and timing their divergence using dates from fossils of one great ape's ancestor. This evolutionary assumption counts on the mtDNA mutation rate of about one mutation every 300 to 600 generations, or one every 6,000 to 12,000 years. But do these evolutionary assumptions hold up? Actually, recent studies have shown that the actual mutation rates are much faster than the rates assumed by evolution theory, causing researchers to rethink the mtDNA clock they depend on for forensic investigations. I covered this ad nauseum in a separate video. Uh, first of all, the this mitochondrial DNA research that has overturned the consensus is one creationist who has only published his research in a creationist journal. Two, the the actual mutation rate that he got, he got by doing pedigree um, studies, pedigree studies. So that's that's taking basically a mother daughter and grandmother and, and calculating a mutation rate between that trio. The problem is pedigree mutation rates by definition, Santos 2008 covers this um, in, in incredible detail, as do I in a separate video, albeit in layman's terms, showed us that pedigree mutation rates are by definition always 100% of the time going to be faster than long-term evolutionary mutation rates. That's just how it goes. I, and this, this applies not even in great lengths of time. Like the mutation rate is going to be different between three individuals versus 100 generations down the line. You don't have to go very far, right? So this is incredibly important to appreciate. But 
you know, you don't hear this from Genesis Apologetics. They come in, they say, a scientist has shown that we're getting faster mutation rates, but he does so using pedigree mutation rates. And interestingly enough, he also does so by citing papers such as Parsons uh, 98, I think Parsons 1998, which is also a bad paper, in due, due in part because it has terrible sampling, it samples from soldiers blown up in foxholes, and two, because its error bars are absolutely tremendous, placing the um, minimal age, the, the, the most recent age for humanity, at a few hundred years ago, and the oldest at a few million. So you really want to take this kind of thing with a grain of salt, which is why none of the conventional scientists are talking about it or taking it seriously, because even myself, someone who is working through a master's degree, can see through this shoddy attempt at, at posturing a model for creationism. Let us continue. This discovery was published in Nature Genetics by Dr. Parsons and his colleague. That's the Parsons paper, the one that I was talking about. Yes, it was published in Nature. It was superseded by dozens of papers that indeed showed why pedigree mutation rates are so much faster than, um, than evolutionary mutation rates and poked a lot of holes in Parsons' methodology. So again, um, you can look at uh, oh, Howell, it's Howell 2001, I think, which again supersedes Parsons, which also gets a faster mutation rate, although albeit not as fast as Parsons, and explains in part why Parsons' results are bad. ...who investigated the mtDNA of 357 individuals from 134 different families representing 327 generational events, which are counted by the number of times that mothers passed on mtDNA to their offspring. Parsons' team showed that mutation rates actually occur at a rate of 1 every 33 generations, which was 20-fold higher than the estimates based on the theoretical 5 million year timeline between chimps and humans that expect about one mutation in every 300 to 600 generations or one every 6,000 to 12,000 years. This study was published in Nature Genetics, and the faster rate has stood fast even as the number of families in the study has doubled. Other studies have confirmed these findings since Parsons' discovery. For example, Howell's... Yeah, so it, I, I really hope you're impressed by... <laughs> I've seen this before. The reason I knew all of this... I, I haven't watched this. The reason I knew this ahead of time was because I have seen this before. This is a classic creationist talking point. Um, when was it? 1996. Okay, so it was actually... When was Parsons? Okay, he doesn't show. That, well, that's because old, both of them are old as dirt, paper-wise. Um, let's try Parsons, 1998. I th that's what I think it is. Yeah, Parsons, 1998. But Howell, Howell and Mackey do actually come out in the 2000s, I believe, is why I was goofing it up. Howell and Mackey, 2003. <coughs> 2003. Yeah, so, and in 2000, right. So, Hal actually came out and BTFO'd Parsons later on. Appreciate, uh, bow before my superior knowledge of creationist literature. <laughs> I'm not that that's creationist literature, sorry. Uh, bow before my knowledge of creationists misusing literature. Animal kinds have substantially underestimated the rate of mtDNA divergence. As well... <laughs> Originally printed by Harper and Brothers in New York City, about 15 years before the Civil War. Is that Freeman? One science writer puts it, evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate. For example, research... This is... This is the Ann Gibbons pop sci article. This isn't even like... This isn't even like a study. Ann Gibbons is not... She's not done a study here. Please appreciate that. Raw Matt over at the Standing for Truth channel conglomerate of Making Fast but Incorrect videos is very keen on bringing up Ann Gibbons' The Study. That's not what this is. It's, it's just obfuscation all the way down. It's that astronaut meme. Hold on. Hold on. Astronaut meme. Yeah, this one. It's this one here. Except instead of this, wait, it's all Ohio, always has been. Instead of that, it's, wait, it's all replacing Darwin talking points, always has been. Wait, it's all incorrect misuse of 
of pop sci articles and conventional science papers that are old as dirt always has been and what they're looking at is creationism so please you know memeing for you on the fly have calcul- like comment and subscribe <laughs> that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mtDNA was ancestral to that in all living people, lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old. This of course fits well within the Bible's timeline. Based on their updated work, identifying 220 soldiers' remains from World War II to the present, Parsons and Holland now have new guidelines adopted by the FBI as well to account for a faster mutation rate. This is this is really genuinely like Ramat has said all of this before. Um, for those of you who don't know, again, Ramat is part of YouTube Creationist Channel. Um, the thing that the FBI is utilizing works because it has to do with fast mutation rates in successive generations. That does not mean that it works when applying it to large timescales, because as I said, it's very well accepted in the genetics community at large that long-term mutation rates are going to be slower than pedigree mutation rates. Period. Full stop. That's just how this works. You aren't going to encounter anything that's going to speed it up from the pedigree rate. So, by definition, as the lineage gets older... The mutation rate slows down. Yes, excellent work, um, my, my lovely viewers. Uh, here's that reference to the soldiers' remains that I told you about. Like, I, you know, sign me up as a freaking, um, like, dress me up as like a, uh, a fortune teller and stick me in one of those boxes that you find at the pier, put it in a coin, and I tell you your future. Um, except it's, what dumb bullshit are creationists going to say this week? And then you put in the quarter, and then I tell you, it's good. Look and replacing Darwin. Or ask again later, if I'm trying to grift you. Studies have also confirmed that there was a massive DNA variability explosion that happened on... It's fucking Tompkins. Right here. Jeffrey Tompkins. The Institute for Creation. You don't get to slide that in under science and pretend that it's legit. Look at this. Is Tompkins up here? Well, God, wouldn't you know it? He's not. Well, what does that tell you? To me, it says Jeffrey Tompkins did a little bit of cherry picking in this article and then wrote an article on it in the Institute for Creation Research website which isn't that just peachy keen um it's not the nature let's see from 2013 the nature results convey a second spectacular confirmation of amazingly biblical conclusions from the first study they confirmed that the human genome began to rapidly diversify not more than 5,000 years ago now wait a second isn't that around the time that the agricultural revolution happened you know that thing that allowed humans to stay in one place and have a lot of kids and reduce infant mortality in the short term? Boy, I wonder, do you think that that might have an impact on human proliferation? Interesting. Boy, that sure, that sure sounds unproblematic for evolutionary theory. I don't know. on earth just thousands of years ago within the time frame of noah's flood and the babel dispersion that occurred afterwards next let's consider the extent of the fossil evidence that exists for human evolution charles darwin postured that if evolution was true innumerable transitional forms must have existed he also questioned why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth Darwin said this, and then within his life, he was vindicated by the finding of Archaeopteryx lithographica, the famous dinosaur-to-bird transition. He said this before he found that, or before that was shown uh, to be, they found it in like a German, German mine, I believe, before he was able to see it in person. Superb um, dishonesty work here, Genesis. Of, I loathe Genesis apologetics. If I could be in a room with Don Biddle, ooh. I'd line it up. Knock it off, Don. This shit is getting old. Actually, is it Dan Biddle? He's just so forgettable amongst the um, the, the creationist org hierarchy.
We agree. If human evolution was true, wouldn't we expect the ground to be filled with numerous transitions between ape-like creatures? We wow, you mean like... <sighs> wow, you mean like these? Wait, Dan. Wait, Dan, you... Wait, you mean like these? Wait. These ones? Oh. You mean these? Dan? Biddle? You mean the ones that we have? You mean the innumerable transitional species that we have existing in every major lineage since the dawn of time, Mr. Biddle? Are those the transitionals you're looking for? These people have absolutely no idea how taphonomy works, and it shows every time they open their mouths. Every single time they open their mouths, it's a, it's boom. Instantly, you are reminded that these guys don't know what taphonomy is and how it works. My response to this is always, first, can you define what taphonomy is? Taphonomy being the study of how things die and preserve, and it turns out it's very difficult to get a fossil. Fossils aren't common for a reason. Now, a better question would be, since sudden burial by water is considered by creationists to be the best means, and by some like Kenthoven, the only means of getting a fossil, if a global deluge happened, why don't we find more of them? We're incredibly lucky to have the fossil record that we have. We have a representative of every, really and truly, every major step in human evolution, which is what really what I care about because I study extant primates. But <coughs> we've got the reptile-mammal transition in absolutely incredible detail. We've got the bird or dinosaur-bird transition, just superb. We've got dinosaurs with feathers up out the wazoo. We've got the, the uh, semi-lunate carpal representing in, in very, very early theropods. That's the one important um, bird bone in the, in the arm and wrist, uh, forearm and wrist. We've got the Cyrenian transition, very well documented. We've got the tetrapod to, or fish to tetrapod transition, very well documented. We've got the one from the proboscideans. Wow, boy, that one sure looks great. We've got several different little minutia of the arthropods, documented. Huge radiations within the Cambrian, huge radiations within the Permian. We've got that evolution of ceratopsians and sauropods, which are, you know, very famous dinosaurs. We've got the evolution of many pterosaurs. We've got the evolution of our ungulates. We've got the evolution of the giraffes. We've got the evolution of di different various minutia of the primates. What more do you want, Dan? We agree with Darwin that the lack of transitions is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory of evolution. Even Ian Tattersall, emeritus curator with the American Museum of Natural History, noted that you could fit all the supposed ape to human fossil evidence into the back of a pickup truck if you didn't mind how much you jumbled everything up. With centuries of recording- I've covered this before already. One, no, that is not the case. Two, my gang of my ilk of science nerds have actually reached out to Ian Tattersall. I've got a screenshot from uh, from the email conversation that one of my my colleagues, one of my buddies, actually had with him. He's appalled at how creationists are just e abusing his work um, in anthropology. So he's he's not happy with it. He does not reach their conclusions. Um, but yeah, that first statement is also just wrong. We I don't know that you could even fit half of like just Homo erectus in a pickup truck, but history and over 7 billion interfertile humans <coughs> on the planet today, we should certainly have more than a truck bed of fossil evidence if evolution was true. Lucy is featured in most public school textbooks as the leading icon to support the theory of human evolution. Listen closely to what Lucy's discoverer Donald Johansson says about Lucy's kind on this BBC video. We now have 400 specimens of Lucy's species Australopithecus afarensis, named after the Afar region. And uh, we know that there are very large individuals, which were males, and the smaller ones uh, are certainly females. 
What Johansson doesn't say is that what he's actually referring to when he says 400 specimens is not the hundreds of upright walking skeletons that are represented in the video. Biddle really, really gets his panties in a twist about this specific graphic because he brings it up in almost every Genesis Apologetics video that I have seen. And I've seen quite a few of them, at least the ones that you know pertain to human evolution. Um, he just really doesn't like this. He, he feels very betrayed by it. But let's let him continue and then we'll dissect the claim. He's actually talking about 400 bone <coughs> fragments, barely enough to scatter on this picnic table. And over 30% of this collection are just teeth. Nearly 50 years of study on Lucy has revealed what many have known since her... Yeah, this is from Answers in Genesis. This is an absolute miscarriage of reconstruction. We'll talk about it in just a second. First, let's discuss that previous claim where he shows the picture. That picture's super out of date. We've been digging up so many Australopithecines, we don't know what to do with all of them. Now, granted, what we're not we're not finding like full full wholesale skeletons every single time. Very frequently we find fragments, but in the same way that you could pick out a human jaw and a pit of random animal bones, you can pick out Australopithecine remains because they have what's called suites of distinct morphologic characteristics that only exist in Australopithecines. So yes, we do know that we are finding Australopithecine remains. We've got a ton of skulls, we've got excellent representation of the entire postcrania, I'm not concerned about Australopithecus afarensis or Australopithecus africanus or Anamensis for that matter. Um, really, the only species that we have in human evolution that are that are like particularly shady are the individuals that we have like single crania for, like for instance, Kenianthropus platyops. This one is not very well known. Um, when I say shady, I don't mean as in we should cast doubt upon them. I simply mean we need a better representation before we can say anything definitive about this species. Um, this reconstruction here is really, 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 really bad. Australopithecus afarensis, as I've said many, many times, was definitively a biped. How do we know this? How do we know that Australopithecus afarensis was a biped? Australopithecus afarensis skeleton. I'm going to tell you really briefly, because we've gone over this so many damn times. First and foremost, um, what's, this is a better... We want this one. This is going to show us very nicely. Um, first and foremost, bull-shaped pelvis. Bull-shaped pelvises exist in animals that hold their weight in a vertical fashion because they create a nice lattice by which muscles of the pelvic floor can hold in all your organs so they don't fall out of you. Number two, the angle of the femoral head seen here and here, as well as in other specimens of Australopithecus afarensis, the angle of the femoral head allows us to hold the weight directly um, on top of the legs, on top of the, the hind limbs for efficient walking. That angle typically goes like this, right? So that the legs don't just go down, otherwise we'd be bow-legged and inefficient. In addition to that, the valgus knee. The knee is also at an angle because it has to have that carrying angle to hold this, this entire column of the body on top of two legs for efficiently walking on these two feet. Next would be the inline big toe. Specifically with Lucy, we don't have the toes of Lucy as a single specimen. Fortunately, we have tons of representation of Australopithecus afarensis feet. Um, little foot is the one I'm looking for. Little foot afarensis. And the foot, interestingly enough, wouldn't you know it, is distinctively bipedal. This is a more inline helix than what we see with any of our of our um, modern great apes. Similarly, this is from Dikika, inline toes. This is the the um, uh, calcaneus back here. And this is the toes in line over here on the right. This is a biped. Again, continuing onward, the ratio of the longer legs when compared to other um, Miocene apes, when compared to the arms, the foramen magnum position, that's the hole at the base of the skull, and angle tells us that it held the skull on top like this, like this, and like this, if you can't see and appreciate, right? This animal was absolutely not craning its neck forward in a quadrupedal knuckle-walking stance, as Answers in Genesis likes to dream up in their pipe dream of a museum. So, yeah. 
we're gonna go ahead and just wash our hands of that one. For discovery. She's just an extinct ape. If there's no historical Adam, there's no gospel. If Adam and the fall are not historical, then Jesus died for a mythological problem and he is a mythological savior offering us a mythological hope. Atheists also understand the problem of a mythical Adam and Eve. No Adam and Eve means no need for a savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth and builds on that as a basis. No fall of a man means no need for atonement and no need for a redeemer. The truth is that we are too sophisticated to evolve out of some primordial mud pit over billions of years. We sing, worship, have ceremonies, pray, educate ourselves, and do so many other things that reflect the fact that we are spiritual beings and not animals. God made us on the sixth day of creation to name and take dominion over the entire animal kingdom. This happened just thousands of years ago. God sent his son to redeem us from the fall that happened when our real forefathers sinned. We have been mercifully brought into a place of grace, forgiveness, and rest if we accept his sacrifice by confessing our sins and surrender our lives to him. Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches? And then we go into um, the shelling. Yeah, so the reason, you know, I was looking forward to this one initially when I watched it, but I've, again, I've covered most of these topics already. Humans are animals by every conceivable metric. We're primates by every conceivable empirical metric. We are apes by every conceivable empirical metric. The things that he lists that humans do that apes don't, other apes rather, don't do um, are impeccably trivial. There are things that other apes do that we don't do. There are things unique to orangutans. There are things unique to bonobos, to chimps, to gorillas, to the gibbons. But interestingly enough, he has a pretty short list, and that's because most of the things that humans do are simply souped-up versions of the things that other apes do. I'm reading a book on this topic right now by Franz DeWall called Mama's Last Hug, which is um, excellent. I'm taking notes on it because I hope to cover some of it in a video. And it goes through the, the, the empathy, the rage, the lust, the grief that all of the other apes experience, just like us, how they teach one another culture, how they figure things out, their theory of mind, problem solving, cognition, language, the roots of it, the gestures. It, it, it is an impeccable book, impeccable book, sorry, stuttering, um, that I would recommend really to anyone. One thing that I also want to talk about is, is really just how Genesis apologetics boxes themselves in with their interpretation of Genesis. I wanted to let you know, um, and I'm, I'm going to pull up my my word document here. I don't know if you guys can actually see it. I don't think you can, so I'll I'll just read it for you. But <coughs> a while back, I read some of the works of John Walton, who's a theistic evolutionist, and he covers the use of Adam in Genesis two, which is important for the Adam and Eve story and how it should be interpreted. Um, so Adam and Eve would not have referred to one another as Adam and Eve, right? Um, they didn't have those names. Those are Hebrew words that mean human and life. Adam means human and Eve means life. Adam is what Adam actually is in the original Hebrew. And if we are to take, if we're assuming a, a Christian standpoint and assuming a literal Adam and Eve and looking at the story under that lens, well, Hebrew wasn't a language yet. So we don't actually know from a Christian standpoint, right, what they called each other. We're just looking at the Hebrew versions of their names later on in time. So we have to look at how the Hebrews actually used the word to understand how it is they understood it. Now, John Walton famously in his books discusses how translating a language is difficult. Translating a culture is damn near impossible. So we have to do our best and go back in time and see, okay, well, how did the Hebrews understand it? Because that's probably going to be closest to the original meaning of the text. Unless, of course, creationists want to say that the Hebrews got it wrong and they got it right. The original Hebrews got it wrong. I don't think that that's a stance that they're willing to take anytime soon. So let's actually look at the usage of the word Adam. So Adam has a couple of different meanings. It can be generic. It can be archetypical, so or archetypal rather. So in reference to humanity, big H humanity. Um, it can be a representational agent, so like an article. It can mean a personal name. Uh, it can be used anomalously occasionally, and it can be used with a preposition attached. So the primary way 
that Genesis uses the word Adam is in the generic, man, literally meaning humanity. In fact, it's not used as a personal name until Genesis 5. That means we're not referring to, from a, from a Hebrew perspective, we're not referring to Adam, the individual person, until Genesis 5. Now, I, I talked earlier in one of these myths videos as to why I think that Genesis 1 and 2 are separate creation accounts. Um, that is to say, humanity, it, from, a, from a Hebrew perspective, was created in Genesis 1, and Adam and Eve, God's people, were created in Genesis 2. Uh, but, but when we actually look at how it's used, um, like, spread out throughout Genesis, it's pretty significant. The generic is used in Genesis 1, 26 through 27, uh, 2, verse 5, 3, verse 22, and 5, verses 1 and 2. The archetypal definition is used in Genesis 2, 7, 18, or 2, 18 rather, uh, 2, 21, 2, 22, and 2, 23. The representational is used in Genesis 2, 8, 15, 16, 19, 25, and Genesis 3, 8, 9, 12, uh, 20 and 24. It's used as a personal name only in Genesis 5, 1 and Genesis 5, 3 through 5. And then it's used anomalously and with a preposition attached uh, in, in elsewhere as well. But primarily, it's the generic and the archetypal. So all of Genesis 1 is referring to Genesis or to uh, generic humanity, at least according to these hermeneutics. I'd be interested to hear like other opinions on this. Basically, the case I'm making here is I don't think any Christian can make um, a solid argument for why young earth creationism is the only interpretation of Genesis. So Adam's name isn't used in reference to a single individual name until Genesis 5. To me, this affirms that um, the Hebrews understood that Adam was a guy who existed in Genesis, like late Genesis, but that humanity was a separate entity entirely. So just my thoughts. And, you know, when he does form Adam, right, like he forms him from dust, which seems to be like a, a very clear understanding of what mortality is, in my opinion, uh, rather than literally forming him from dust. But this is just my two cents. And I'm not typically like considering myself a theologian. But we also covered, a, you know, why in my opinion, a literal Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago is bupkis anyways. And I think that's going to do it for this for this episode of the, the Seven Myths. We will continue our journey very shortly. I hope you all take excellent care of yourselves. <laughs>